Welcome back to AP Physics. The other day we introduced the basics of magnetic fields and magnetic forces. Today we're going to apply those to a specific technology called a mass spectrometer. So let's introduce this with a problem. An alpha particle, which is a helium nucleus and a hydrogen nucleus, are accelerated separately through a potential difference of 50 volts. We want to calculate the speed of each particle. So to be able to calculate Okay, we've got our basic setup. We're analyzing just the beginning right here where we release our, our uh, particle from rest and it accelerates because it's attracted to the negative charges and repelled from the positive charges. This is the basic idea of a particle accelerator. Okay, what we have going on here, we can analyze with conservation of energy. So I'm going to say the energy when the alpha particle is released is equal to the energy basically at the end of the 50 volts. Now what we have in terms of energy when it's released, we have an electric potential energy and what happens is that energy becomes kinetic energy. So electric potential energy Q times V and that's from our base equation V is equal to um, potential energy per charge, and that's going to be equal to then one half mv squared. From there, it's a matter of plugging our values in to be able to solve down for that velocity. So then the charge of an alpha particle, uh, you've got two neutrons and two protons, so then two times 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. That's your charge times V, which is 50 volts. And that's equal to one half your mass, two neutrons and two protons. They have about the same mass, 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms, and then V squared. And then doing the algebra to be able to solve down for V, we're going to get a velocity of 6.92 times 10 to the fourth meters per second. Likewise, we're going to come over here for the hydrogen atom, conserving as much space as I can. I'm going to pull the same logic here and then basically just plug in the numbers here for the hydrogen atom. Your hydrogen atom has a nucleus that is just one proton. So when we plug into Q times V, that's going to be a 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. And again, multiplied by the 50 volts equals your 1 half times the 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms times V squared. I'm going to come back here and solve down for V. And we're going to get a value of 9.79 times 10 to the fourth meters per second. Backing up for one second over here, that's the mass of a proton, okay, which is about the same as the mass of a neutron. I have four total particles there. So there should be a factor of four in there. This answer does reflect that factor of four being in there. So now we can see that our particles, alpha particle, hydrogen, accelerated through the same potential difference, do not have the same velocity at the end of that. So then they enter the second part here, which is a combination of an electric field and a magnetic field, and they're traveling at different velocities. So then in part B, we've got each particle passes into the region where you have that electric field and magnetic field, and you want to calculate the net force on each particle. So then in our diagram here, we accelerated through the particle accelerator, and now our charged particle is coming into here with a certain velocity. Now, it's a positively charged particle. And if it's a positively charged particle, and I think about the positive plate there and the negative plate here, it's going to experience an electrostatic force that is in the downward direction. Magnetic force, QV cross B, 
here's V, crossed into B into the board, my magnetic force is going to be upward. And so then I have an upward magnetic force and a downward electric force, and we want to calculate the net force on each. So then in part B, if we deal with our alpha particle and our hydrogen, alpha particle net force, we're not going to put an MA there. We just want to calculate what the net force is. We saw from the diagram, that's going to be a combination of the magnetic force minus the electrical force. That magnetic force QV cross B, the cross product, the sign is going to be 90 degrees because velocity is along the board and field is into the board. So this is going to be a QVB minus your electric force, which we can express as a Q times E from our field equation, field is equal to force over charge. So then plugging in values here for the alpha particle, I've got two protons, two times 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, times the velocity we calculated over here, 6.92 times 10 to the fourth meters per second. Okay, then multiplied by the field, which is 0.92 Teslas, minus E, or minus Q times E, that's a 2 times 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs, and then multiplied by your field, which was the 4.5 times 10 to the fifth volts per meter. That's going to give us a value of 5.97 times 10 to the negative 15th Newtons in that upward direction. Doing the same math for the hydrogen, which I'm going to slide down here because I don't think I'm going to have enough room up there. And so then for the hydrogen, just plugging straight into the equation, you have a single proton, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. Your velocity right here are 9.79 times 10 to the fourth meters per second, minus Q times Z, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th. And then multiplied by the field, that was the 4.5 times 10 to the fifth. So then when we plug those in and we calculate, we get a value for that force to be a 7.21 times 10 to the negative 15 newtons, also in an upward direction. So two different particles, Entering the same potential difference, the same particle accelerator, come out the other side with different velocities. Then when they go into the magnetic field, because they have different velocities, they experience different forces. So you have a particle accelerator. Now, thinking more about this unit where we had the two fields, the electric field and the magnetic field, that is the second part of a mass spectrometer. And when it's set up correctly, it can be used to be what is called a velocity selector. In other words, in part C, we want to describe the path of each, and then we want to talk about how could a particle pass through this section undeflected. If we describe the path of each, they're different particles, they experience different forces, these net forces are to the side, of the motion. So both of these forces would be centripetal forces. Centripetal forces, they're going to go in circular paths. They have different forces. They're going to go in different circular paths. If we calculated the centripetal acceleration, which would also then account for the difference in mass of the particles, we would get different centripetal accelerations. Your alpha particle would go in a circle of a larger radius 
and your hydrogen atom would go in a circle of a smaller radius. Now, considering then part D, velocity selector, we want a particle to go through undeflected. If we want it to go through undeflected, then up here where we calculated the extra newtons, we can't have any extra newtons. So then we want net force to be equal to zero. Let's take the equation here. QVB minus QE, and we want that total to be zero. Well, right away, we can see we've got a Q on both of those, and that'll divide out. So I'm going to end up with V times B minus E is equal to zero. If I solve this down for V, V would be equal to E over B. If we have particles traveling the right velocity, which we can control by setting the particle accelerator, and then we set specific values to the ratio of the electric field to the magnetic field, we can set it so that particle experiences zero force here, okay, and goes through undeflected. But the velocity, as we saw here, for a set value was different for our different particles. So then literally we can select out a certain particle to be able to pass based on what the charge is and what the mass is. Okay, one of these would be able to pass for a certain ratio of E to B, the other one would not, okay, because they would be traveling at different velocities. Now, all of that comes together for the idea of a mass spectrometer. Now, let's summarize. A mass spectrometer, which is essentially these three elements all combined. First part, particle accelerator on the left side. The simplest idea of a particle accelerator is just to take a charged particle and release it between two charged plates. It will accelerate across there to a certain velocity. On the particle accelerator, we're going to use conservation of energy. Energy when it's released equals energy when it reaches the negative plate to be able to solve down for velocity. Following the particle accelerator, we reach a region where there are two fields, an electric field and a magnetic field, and these are structured such that you will experience an electric force on the charged particle in one direction and a magnetic force in the opposite direction. The idea of the velocity selector is then to balance those two forces out for a given particle of a certain charge and a certain mass so that it is able to pass through. So just as we did in the math just a minute ago, when we balance those forces out, we get V is equal to the ratio of E to B. Those charged particles then enter the third region, the actual mass spectrometer part, whereby what happens is they go in a curved path, and we're going to apply Newton's second law, and that force equals mass times acceleration. And the QV cross B, or QVB sine theta, will then be equal to MV squared over R. And we can solve down for the radius of the charge. Now notice in your radius equation, you end up with a mass to charge ratio. So your particles are going to go at different radii based on the ratio of their mass to their charge. Knowing ionization patterns of different atoms, you can identify what atom you have based on the mass to charge ratio because the other terms in that equation v and b v you set by the particle accelerator b is external and you're setting that also so then you know what particles you have based on what radius they travel in let me animate this and that'll make a little bit more sense before i activate this simulation kind of talking through some specifics here so you understand what's going on. The particle accelerator is not shown. The actual particle accelerator part would be over here. So then you have the particle that is entering, we'll just say a positively charged particle, it is entering 
the velocity selector. Some of the particles will pass, some of the particles won't pass. Down here on the table, the different options we'll have to choose from is when the velocity is smaller than e to b, ratio of e to b, equal to the ratio of e to b, and greater than the ratio of e to b. Once particles are selected and they pass through, they'll come out on this side, and then we'll see how their motion curves. Here's our simulation, and what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna start with the velocities that are lower than e to b. If you're traveling lower than e to b, notice what happens even as I change the mass. They're going too slow, and so you, one of your forces wins out, and it's going to direct them off to the side plate. By the same idea, if the velocity is too great, the other force wins out and they get deflected off to the side. When your ratio is exactly E to B, then the particles travel out across. Their velocity is selected. Notice the shape of the curved path there. Now if I double the mass, it goes to a different radius. If I triple the mass, it goes to a different radius. So that difference, all these had the same charge of Q, uh, one positive, but they had different masses and they went to different locations. So setting up sensors to detect where the particles go, we can deduce exactly what atoms are there. What are mass spectrometers used for? On the right side, it says areas in which mass spectrometers are used. You've got all kinds of uses in medicine different pharmaceutical applications, different clinical applications in terms of screaming, screening, <laughs> blood tests, drug testing, different environmental tests, uh, geological tests, biotechnology. So mass spectrometers are used basically when we don't know what something is made of and we wanna break it apart and tell on the atomic level what it is made of. That's what we use a mass spectrometer for. Let me give you a specific example. Several years ago, I toured the company called International Paper. And when I toured them, uh, one thing they were testing was orange juice containers. An orange juice container that they were making was giving an odd scent. Um, and it was not pleasing to those people that were buying the orange juice. So what they did is they took the packaging, which had seven different individual layers to be able to preserve the orange juice, and they broke it apart layer by layer to analyze where that scent was coming from. So they analyzed the layers, they ionized the substances in the layers, and sent it through a mass spectrometer. Now, in a mass spectrometer, you had particles going to different radii, and the only way to be able to determine which of the particles or which of the combinations was giving the scent was on the mass spectrometer machine, they had a little face mask app apparatus so that a person could put it over their nose and they could sniff those ions that were coming through and they determine which of the layers and which of the substances were giving that scent. In summary on a mass spectrometer, you've got a particle accelerator, followed by a velocity selector, followed by a mass spectrometer. Each of these calculations at the bottom are used in a mass spectrometer. They also come into play individually, especially the particle accelerator, because there are a lot of other applications of particle accelerators that we're gonna get into. Now let's shift from the mass spectrometer to other specific applications of just the particle accelerators. The diagram you see here is a basic display, okay, a basic screen in terms of what you would see in a traditional TV, an older big TV, not the flat screens. They're using a little bit different process. This is a simple particle accelerator. We can get the idea of what is going on in the back you have a cathode and that is basically a wire that is charged very negatively and what happens there is you release electrons that will then be accelerated the accelerating anodes here are going to be charged very positively so the electrons are attracted 
pass through a hole in the center and accelerate up to a certain velocity by the time they reach the end. There are then deflection coils. These deflection coils are basically setting up magnetic fields to be able to push the electrons this way or that way to be able to hit different little pixels that are out here on the screen. A pixel is basically an element, like a tiny little light bulb, and it will give off light if it's energized. Well, it's energized when an electron hits it traveling at a high velocity, it will cause that pixel to emit light. And so in those traditional displays, you accelerated electrons up to certain speeds, you smash them into the pixel, they transferred their energy, and that pixel gave off light. And the combination of thousands and thousands of these pixels giving off different colors of light gave the total picture onto the display screen. These types of displays are still used in things like oscilloscopes and other scientific equipment. This idea of a particle accelerator is also used inside of a microwave oven, but it's a little bit more complex particle accelerator. It's called a cyclotron. And I have several of these in the classroom. I wish I could show them to you, but let's talk about the basic idea of what's going on inside this cyclotron. We're going to animate here in just a second, but here's your basic idea. We have two D shapes. This is the upper D and this is the lower D and they're called D's because they look like D's. They're just on their sides and they set up magnetic fields. Notice the little yellow dots that are there. Those yellow dots represent the magnetic field. So both in A and B, that magnetic field will be pointing up towards us. In the center, notice you have a little hole. Charges will come out of here. Charges will be released. Over here on the side, you have a variable power supply. So what that's going to do is it's going to charge this side of the D positive, etc. This side of the D negative. And then an instant later, it's going to switch those. So it's going to be continually oscillating back and forth between what's positive and what's negative. What happens then, this charged particle, when... Yeah, this so much isn't going to work. Use your imagination. We're going to draw arrows. This electron, it's going to go downward when you have positive charges down on the bottom. But once it goes downward, then it enters the magnetic field, and then it's going to circulate around. Now, when it gets to there, what's going to happen is the variable power supply, this is not working very well, the variable power supply is going to switch around where the charges are. So that electron's coming around here with a velocity, now it's going to be attracted over there, and then it's going to circulate, and then when it gets to here, the variable power supply will flip the positive and negative, and it will accelerate again across there and loop around and it'll flip over here and accelerate around there. So then basically each time that that electron passes this gap between the Ds, it will get this kick in velocity. It will be accelerated by the electric field. And so it goes faster and faster and faster. So we're taking what would otherwise be a very long path and we're wrapping it around to make it a very compact compact technology. Eventually then, that electron is traveling all the way around out here, and it comes out here, and then it's enabled to pass and smash into a target out there. It transfers its energy to atoms in that target, and those atoms in that target then emit microwaves. Those microwaves in a microwave oven then go and cook your food. Now, let's consider an animation of the cyclotron. Yes, this is a foreign site, so it's in a foreign language, but it still works basically the same. The green line 
That's the electron that's coming out. Notice it follows around in that circulating pattern. Each time it gets to the gap between the Ds, it's moving in the direction that the electric field is going to put a force on it. And so it gets a boost in velocity, which means it will spiral out farther and farther. And eventually it will surpass the radius of the magnets. And then it will come over and smash into the detector here. Notice over here, you're sh showing the boost in the energy and as a result the velocity. Your magnetic field is constant, but your electric field here is always changing so that it will apply a force to that charge in the direction it's moving each time it passes that gap. And so you get up to very high velocities in a very compact shape. Now, other particle accelerators, larger particle accelerators, like the Large Hadron Collider, buried way underneath the ground, 17 miles in circumference, same idea almost as your cyclotron, except cyclotrons are limited in how fast they can get particles. Instead of having the large D-shaped magnets, which are very difficult to get in larger sizes, what we do is we only establish the magnetic field where we need it. So I'm gonna hop back to here for a second. You have a charged particle that's moving, and so using electric currents, you produce a magnetic field to steer that electron, an electric field to accelerate it, it goes faster and faster. If you modify the magnetic field, then you can increase the centripetal force with a stronger magnetic field. So what you end up with is a fixed radius tube in a circle that you can use generating the magnetic field only in the region where the charges are to be able to get those charges to move faster and faster with an electric field. And then we smash them into things. And a lot of the research in terms of what's going on with these larger particle accelerators is just trying to figure out what matter is made of on the most fundamental sense. We take a particle, we smash it, we look at the radiation trail from the particle, and from that radiation trail, we deduce what was there before we smashed it. It's kind of like taking a, a glass mug, throwing it on the floor, and then analyzing the pieces to try to figure out what was on it or what was in it before it shattered. So that's what a lot of the research with uh, particle accelerators goes into. Ponder physics.